He's a political and economic affairs commentator. Einer, uh, let's start with President Xi's remarks. I lifted part of his speech. He said at one point, economic globalization is showing renewed resilience and the call for upholding multilateralism and enhancing communication and coordination has grown stronger. While we live in an age rife with challenges, it's also an age full of hope. His was rather upbeat, wasn't it, the speech? Well, yes, and, and a very, very stark contrast, Mike, to what's been uh, you know, offered by uh, Blinken and the Biden administration. And I think that was the point. Uh, what uh, she wanted to do was emphasize uh, not only that China's vision going forward, but also, you know, allude to the fact that China has uh, the chops to show that they've been able to do it in the past. You know, after over the last 40 years, China has advanced. They have, you know, 880 million people advance, uh, you know, brought out of poverty. Uh, whereas in the U.S., uh, the middle classes and has shrank and the poor have grown during that same period of time. So he's, he's not saying that China's system is the system for everybody, but he is saying that there is a shared future uh, between countries that have different systems and different ideas, and it's based on trade, mutual respect, and commonality. And the interesting thing is uh, there's been so much red-hot uh, dialogue going back and forth, uh, especially during the Trump administration and, and with Biden as well, uh, since he's entered office. But it seemed those uh, she was kind of offering an olive branch to the U.S., advising, saying, look, consultation, that's the way to go, all countries working together. Is that a correct read? And, and are those remarks likely to have much of an impact here in Washington? Well, I don't think they're going to have much impact in Washington. Uh, the table is set there. I mean, you have bipartisan, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I can't say more than, you know, they just don't like China in, in the U.S. right now. Um, and that goes very deeply into the electorate. Uh, there's this feeling that uh, China is responsible for anything that goes wrong in, the, in America, including the, you know, mishandling of COVID-19. I think she um, is actually speaking more to the rest of the world. Uh, saying that there are two different paths that can be taken, that the, in essence, the world is at a crossroads. It can either adopt uh, what the U.S. is offering, which, um, you know, it's this leadership, but not the ability to show that they've, you know, by example, that they've been able to do this domestically or internationally, but saying that this world order should be maintained under U.S. hegemony, or, as uh, he put it, uh, this should be a multipolar world where people are cooperating and respecting each other's differences, uh, but trying to figure out how they can get along. So, um, as I said, Mike, not much chance of any kind of uh, of change, but it is a rational voice that I think the rest of the world is going to heed. Well, let's talk about RCEP because it was signed in November. Give us a sense of how that changes the landscape because what you're talking about, you know, the U.S. at that time drifting towards protectionism under four years of Trump, China out in front on the globalization front. Well, yes. I mean, for four years, uh, the, the U.S. has been largely AWOL absent uh, without leave, as they say in the Army. Um, you know, uh, it, it's not just uh, not participating in RCEP, but also withdrawing from TI, uh, TP, uh, TIPP. Uh, it was not, uh, you know, America's finest hours. Uh, four years later, the U.S. is not part of any working uh, international uh, agreement other than the one that they negotiated under, you know, <laughs> by, by pressure uh, with uh, Canada and Mexico. So the U.S. has a lot of ground to make up. And instead of saying, let's talk about our differences, you're seeing this kind of, you have to do this, you, you know, this kind of pressure politics uh, that Blinken uh, is trying to push. And under the guise of saying that we should all cooperate against China, uh, it's really, it seems the, the subtext here is contain China and keep us at the top and everything will be fine. But the last 40 years doesn't bear that out. She also uh, said in his remarks that when the pandemic is under control, China is going to host a second conference on dialogue of Asian civilization. So how might that play out and why is it important? Well, that, that's uh, informational. I mean, there's, there's a sense that there is a chasm between cultures. Uh, and it's not just between the U.S. And, and, uh, and, and China, I mean, between almost all countries. It didn't matter maybe 15, 20 years ago because China was just rising up. But now these cultural differences and attitudes, uh, for instance, how uh, people in China view human rights, which is you know, about safety in the streets, uh, economic opportunity, et cetera, versus the U.S. where it's a ballot box and a, you know, the ability to just say whatever you want. 
So these differences have to be addressed. And uh, the Chinese have had a lot of success going back to ping pong diplomacy and person to person diplomacy. They believe that uh, the way uh, forward is to know more about each culture. And th this is not China saying that, you know, you have to learn about China. This is China saying we want to learn about you. So it's as again, it's an example of this kind of two way street that Xi Jinping is proposing that is about mutual respect and learning more about each other's differences so that they can over, over, be overcome in the interest of mutual uh, benefits. Einar, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for your insights.